The April 8th meeting of the East Penn Board of School Directors is hereby called to order. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first on the agenda is the uh, report from the Mace High School uh, Student Government Association, uh, Sajun Patel and Sydney Solieri. Okay, so for the student government update, um, one of our upcoming events is the ice cream social for seniors. So we get a bunch of ice cream for the seniors to celebrate um, each other, with each other during their final days at Emmaus. And then one of our last events is graduation flowers. So SGA will be selling flowers to the family and friends of our graduating class on graduation, which is June 9th. For other events led by other class officers, we have the senior picnic, which is the morning of May 3rd. And then following that evening, we have the senior ball from 5 to 10 at the Ice Palace in Allentown. And then after senior ball, STEP is running the after ball for um, students, which is lasts from 11.30 to 4.30 in the morning on Saturday. <laughs> so there's plenty of food and games and prizes for our students to enjoy. And this offers students a safe and fun environment after prom, which is really important. And then finally, we have the junior prom on Saturday, May 11th. Mm -hmm. And then um, for Emmaus across the globe, so we have students at um, Emmaus that are extremely fortunate to have opportunities of global learning. So they are able to have these experiences and then connect them to what is happening in the classroom. Throughout this spring and summer, our students will have the authentic education in, ed in various locations around the globe. And I can actually speak from experience. So I've traveled to Alaska and Iceland over the past year with the National Parks Club. And I can truly say that these experiences are once in a lifetime. I was able to learn so many fascinating things in an amazing and new environment while connecting information to the class. So several other departments are running these trips. For instance, the world language trips, um, German and French classes levels three through five are going to France, Switzerland, Austria, and Germany over Easter break. And then the Spanish department is going to Costa Rica in the summer. Um, I can also speak to personal experience also. So I'm involved in the chorus at Mace High School. And so my sophomore year, I was fortunate enough to go on another international trip to France, Germany, and Switzerland. And it was just amazing to learn all the different culture there and the music. So with the Mace High School crowd this year, we're fortunate enough to have an international tour to Italy from April 14th through 23rd. So we're, we're going to be performing at magnificent venues throughout uh, all regions of Italy uh, with culminating performances at a mass at St. Peter's Basilica uh, on the Monday after Easter and at the Sistine Chapel the following day in Vatican City, wow. which is incredible. Um, other experiences that our student body will be able to have um, include this coming June, uh, the humanities teachers are running a trip to Japan for 11 days um, and then the National Park Club uh, is having a trip over Easter break to Iceland and they also have some summer trips planned they have four of them actually so from June 20th through June 30th uh, there's a trip running to Alaska from June 2nd through 9th there's a trip to Utah uh, from July 10th through 17th there's a trip to the Pacific Northwest and from July 19th through 27th there's a trip to Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park uh, some other student recognition uh, so this past weekend 10 Amaze High School students from the chorus band and orchestras participated in the PMEA All-State Music Festival um, in Pittsburgh, and two students participated in the uh, NAFME All-Eastern Choir this weekend in Pittsburgh as well. Um, some upcoming events amongst our student body, uh, the Activism Club at our high school is holding their second annual uh, Day of Action on Wednesday, April 10th. Uh, on Friday, April 12th, from 5.30 to 9, uh, the Jazz Band is having their uh, annual Jazz Band Festival. Uh, some other uh, concerts from the music department include Friday, April 26th at 7.30 is the Amaze High School Spring Band Concert. Uh, Tuesday, April 29th at 7.30 is the Spring Orchestra Concert. Uh, Thursday, May 9th at 7.30 is the Chorus Concert. And the next day after that, on Friday, May 10th at 7.30 is the Acapella Concert featuring uh, our two acapella groups at the school from out of nowhere in Acapella. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for our student representatives? 
I would like to make one comment. You mentioned the step after ball. I'd like to thank all the um, people, community members, who helped put that on. It's a huge uh, undertaking, but I think it's a wonderful, um, it's a fun uh, way for kids, uh, something for kids to do in the evening after the ball. And I think it's a, it's a great service to the to the district. Any other questions? Comments? Well, you're welcome to stay for the meeting. You're also welcome to uh, to go back and uh, work on your school activities. <laughs> Here's a free sticker for you in Sydney. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is request to address the board. I have none. So moving on to approval of minutes. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Next we have a presentation on communities and schools. As Dr. Pekarik comes forward and introduces um, members of our team who, were, who will be joining her in presenting tonight, I just wanted to take a moment to um, thank not only members of our high school team who are here this evening, but really to um, just express our appreciation to communities and schools. Um, it's The partnership has been such a tremendous asset for, for us as an organization, as well as for our students. So Linda, I'll let you introduce your team tonight. Okay, thank you. Good evening, I appreciate this opportunity to address the school board this evening, and the purpose of our presentation is twofold. The first is to give you an update on communities and schools at Emmaus High School, and the second is to pre present a grant opportunity for our two middle schools. So I'd like to introduce uh, who is joining me from CIS this evening. Tammy Patterson is the CIS coordinator at Emmaus High School. Mike McCorston from CIS, he's the executive vice president. And Tim Mulligan, who is the president and CEO of CIS. Joining me this evening from East Penn is Jen Carolla, who is the high school counseling department chair. We also have Mike Kelly, who is principal at Iyer. And I have the middle level supervisor, Stacy Carpinento, and also Sandra Joseph, who is the high school uh, supervisor for special ed. So I'd like to start out the presentation with the genesis for partnering, partnering with communities and schools. And it began with the formation of the district's behavior support subcommittee in 2016. And this committee was formed uh, due to the volume of behaviors and crisis intervention district-wide. So we examined different agencies at that time and we found that CIS was the best fit for our school district. On July 1st, 2017, CIS services were implemented at Emmaus High School. And these are some of the reasons why we partnered with CIS. Um, we had increased mental health concerns that impeded students' success in the classroom. And as you'll see later on in the presentation, we continue to have needs in those specific areas. I'd like to now introduce Tammy Patterson, who will do this part of the presentation. Good evening, everyone. I just want to give you a brief, a very brief overview of who Communities and Schools actually is for those of you who may be new and, and not real familiar. We are a national nonprofit agency. Um, throughout the nation, we serve almost 1.5 million students per year. And what we do is we help students with non-academic obstacles in order to facilitate their academic success. So for example, students that may have some of those risk factors that Linda had just addressed uh, in the last slide, those students, for instance, may um, have high anxiety. So that's stopping them from coming to school, which then is creating chronic absenteeism. It's affecting their grades. So those are the types of things that we will focus on those non-academic pieces in order to address the academic success. The mission statement of Communities and Schools is to surround students with a community of support, empowering them to stay in school and achieve in life. 
We have our five basics philosophy in communities and schools, and that is that every student needs and deserves a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a caring adult, a safe place to learn and grow, a healthy start and a healthy future, a marketable skill set upon graduation, and a chance to give back to their peers and their community. So this is our CIS national model of how we come in and collaborate with the school. So I'm, I'll just give you a real brief uh, background of this. It starts off with our CIS affiliates. We have affiliates at our national level, our state level, as well as our local level. We have our site coordinators, which is me, the, the people um, on the, the ground here doing uh, integrated student supports. Then we have um, a collaborative partners who are agencies such as Valley Youth House, uh, Karen Treatment Centers, Center for Humanistic Change. We, we broker their services to have them come in and provide services uh, to the students in addition to what I provide. Uh, we come into the school and every year we perform a needs assessment to determine what school-wide goals the, uh, the particular school thinks are necessary and top priority. Then we do the planning. That's pretty much what I do during the, the summertime. And then I actually uh, implement the integrated student supports throughout the school year. If you see the um, blue and the red and the green, those are what we call tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one are our school-wide services. Those are, they address our school-wide needs and our school-wide goals, which I'll address that on another slide. Tier two are, are the targeted programs, which are support groups um, here at Emmaus High School. Th they are um, groups of students with similar needs that we bring together and uh, have them uh, go to support groups during our flex block uh, scheduling time. Tier three is where I spend most of my day. Those are with the case managed students, um, working one on one with them, addressing those obstacles and trying to address the academic success. Throughout the school year, we're monitoring and, and adjusting. Formally, it's done in a quarterly quarterly report throughout the year, but we basically monitor and, and adjust all the time as we review things as we go along. And then we evaluate at the end of the year, and we start the process all over again. This is just a snapshot of my caseload it's year to date as of April 1st for this year. However, the 1718, obviously, that's for the entire school year last year. So you'll see that my referrals have grown this year from it was 100 to 116 as of right now. Students that transferred or withdrew for this year so far as 12 compared to 26 last year. What that really means is that we have students that may decide to go to LCTI full time, they may um, go to cyber school, they may transfer out of the district. Whatever the reason is, my caseload kind of becomes a revolving door throughout the school year um, as I address the, the students that, that come and go. We had nine uh, parents or students that did refuse services. For the most part, the refusals this year tended to be that parents had um, other outside services in place already for the student, whether that's in the form of of outside counseling or other behavioral supports that were in place and they didn't feel it was necessary for the student to have the services in the school. Uh, unsuccessful attempts, only had one this year. I did pretty good with that. All that is is if I've tried three or four times to get a consent form from a parent and either I can't get them on the phone or whatever, I just put them in a file and then if that student, if that comes back up again, I can pull it out and maybe we can try again at a later date. 
the wait list, uh, we started out, if, for those of you that were here last year when I presented to you over the summer, we anticipated um, my starting out the school year with a full caseload. And that's exactly what happened. I had a wait list from day one with approximately, if I recall, it was about 12 on the wait list at that time. The wait list went up to about 23 at some time. We were able to move some off of the wait list. Um, and at this point right now, there are currently 15 that are still on the wait list. Currently, like I said, as of April 1st, I am uh, serving, uh, I'm case managing 68 students at this time. This is just a snapshot of the, the demographics. 89 students are regular education, 16 are learning support, and 11 are emotional support. So here are the school-wide goals that I had addressed a little bit earlier. We, when we do our needs assessment, it's determined what three areas school-wide we, um, the school believes um, is top priority. So it's the same as this for this year as it was for last year uh, to improve the social emotional learning of the of the student body, to reduce chronic absenteeism, and to reduce student suspensions. So the tier ones that I have either um, done already or am anticipating doing before the end of the year, again, this is tier one for the whole school. Uh, we have a mindfulness meditation group that's open to students, uh, anyone that wants to do it during flex block. We have a yoga class after school for students that are interested in doing that once a week. We um, will be doing our mental health awareness uh, campaign in May for Mental Health Awareness Month. And that involves every student through their homeroom receiving a mental health resource card. And then there will also be some informational announcements on ETV. Then we did PREP, which is through Karen Treatment Centers. It stands for Prevention Resources and Education for Parents. It is um, basically the latest drug trends. Last year, you may recall, we did a uh, vaping presentation. I believe it was at one of the middle schools, and we had parents come out and um, see this presentation. This year, we thought it was a really good idea to have the teachers in the high school due to the high level of vaping at this point to really be educated on um, that issue as well. So during a, an in-service, we did have Karen come out and present the same exact presentation to all of the, the teachers. Uh, we did an attendance awareness campaign in September for um, Attendance Awareness Month. That involved a video that some of our communication students did speaking um, about the importance of attendance. There were some teachers on the video and students on the video as well. And then um, I'm proud to talk about our first annual East Penn District Mental Health Symposium that we just had on March 30th, um, two, two weeks ago. And um, it was a collaborative effort between the um, school counselors, school psychologists, and communities and schools. We had about 75 per participants registered for the event. We had approximately 50 participants that were, were present. Uh, we had a uh, really strong representation from all of the schools. This, this was district-wide. And it was, a, it was very even as far as the elementary schools, the middle schools, and the high schools. So we were pleased with that. Um, we already have some discussions in place for next year because our feedback was very positive. We had a survey at the end and we had them, uh, we had parents um, discuss what they would like to see for next year and they really um, wanted us to bring back some of this, the same topics for more in-depth information. So we're looking into that. We're also discussing possibly doing a, a mental health series in the fall.
So we just started talks about that. Some of the topics included um, anxiety, suicide and self-harm, parenting, parenting strategy, yeah, strategies, um, uh, building resilience in your students, bullying versus conflict, just to give you an idea of some of the things that were discussed that day. So our groups, our support groups that we're running this year, they start usually around the um, second marking period and they usually run throughout the, the remainder of the year. We do an anxiety management coping skills group. Uh, Center for Humanistic Change comes in and does that group. Smoking cessation group we started this year. That has been um, something that we did related to the new the new policy in East Penn uh, relating to the the vaping. Um, if there's a, a vaping um, discipline. Um, referral that a student would have the opportunity to go through the smoking cessation group rather than to take the one day suspension. So we've had a pretty good turnout with that. Eight students so far have successfully completed and nine students are currently participating. We do ant anticipate one more group that we're going to squeeze in at the, at the very end because there is a need for it. We do have some students waiting to attend that group. And then we have Karen Treatment Centers doing a new group this year. It's called Kids of Promise. And what that group is, is for students that have family members, whether it's a parent, a, uh, a sibling, anyone in their family that is suffering from substance abuse issues. And that group has gone very, very well. There's only five students in there, but it's actually a perfect size. And the students have gotten wonderful feedback from them, <coughs> as well as from the facilitator saying how she was so pleased how the students have really opened up and are supporting each other. And it's just, it's going really well. Um, I was excited about that group. This is just a comparison of mid-year to mid-year from last year at this time, they were the end of second marking period to this year's second uh, end of second marking period. So we measure, and this is case managed students so that you understand that, we measure academic attendance and behavior. Each student is assigned goals depending on what their needs are, which is determined when they first come on my caseload. The uh, academic um, piece, you'll see that um, for the students that were assigned an academic goal, we had 61% um, met or were making progress toward their academic goal, 56% at this point this year, attendance 70% versus 74, and behavior 70% versus 89%. Good evening. Before we get into the data that you have in front of you, I just want to make mention of, obviously, as Tammy just spoke to, her data shows that she's making tremendous progress with the students that she's working with. But sometimes what the data and the statistics cannot show you are the intangible impact that a person such as Tammy can have on students and families. And sometimes that impact is, is visible in, in parent and student testimonials. So I'd like to take just a moment to read a testimonial from a parent of a student on Tammy's caseload. She's been working with that student for the past year. The student is still currently here at the high school and she continues to remain on Tammy's caseload. The world is surely not the same place as when my husband and I were in high school. It used to be the safest place to send your kid, not anymore. In addition, the level of stress, anxiety, and pressure, along with the need to succeed, can be overwhelming for a kid trying to find their way through their teenage years. Since the world has changed, the support we provide our kids in school needs to change along with it. 
Nothing has ever come easy to our daughter. She's had to work hard for every grade she's ever received, but was always a great student until the wheels fell off the bus due to what would finally be diagnosed in the past year as ADD, depression, and anxiety. We are 100% confident that the budgets and funding towards adding the CIS program was invaluable and critical in helping us uncover several issues that were hindering our daughter's success and ability to navigate her path through high school. In addition, there was always a triangle of reliable support and communication between Tammy Patterson, Mrs. Signorella School Psychologist, and Mrs. Green High School School Counselor. We consistently observed a team effort in ensuring our daughter's success. We found Ms. Patterson to always be responsive and immediate, especially during the hardest times when we didn't know where else to turn. Her door was always open for our daughter to stop by. Our daughter always felt comfortable approaching Tammy and knew she had a safe and confidential place to air her fears, thoughts, and struggles. She also felt Tammy was easy to relate to and continues to help address her fears and anxiety over school and grades. We are not sure what we would have done without the CIS program. There was a sincere interest and commitment to helping our daughter find her way and manage her struggles. So again, I think that just highlights some of the intangibles that can't be measured by the numbers that you see on the charts that we present before you. As we transition to this data here, I just want to make mention of this. These are the incidents of our logged mental health and crisis log that we have as counselors. We presented this information to you last year as well, and I have that data on the next slide. This is year-to-date data. As you will note, the concerns that are still most prevalent amongst our high school students are anxiety, suicide ideation, family issues, and depression. I should note that incidents, there are many instances of comorbidity between these concerns. So for instance, when a student comes and presents with perhaps suicide ideation, oftentimes there's a comorbidity of depression present or pot potentially anxiety or family issues. To date, we have had 145 students logged on this crisis log, um, again, through the end of March. Here's the comparison from last year's data to our current data. You'll note that last year's data is for the full academic school year. So we are a little bit down in terms of number of incidents reported. I do anticipate that those numbers will go up as we have a full quarter left to finish the school year. But as I make mention, Still the areas of greatest concern for our student body are anxiety, suicide ideation, the family issues, and depression. Self-harm is not too far behind, as well as some peer conflict. We probably are on track to fall slightly under where we landed last year, but I think it goes without saying that there are still concerns for our student population and there's, a, there's certainly a valid need to continue services, interventions, and supports to address the mental health of all of our students. And this is all done, I just want to make mention, as a team effort, as the parent alluded to in the letter that she wrote, along with communities and schools, our school psychologists, our school counselors work hand in hand through a partnership that we really um, are invested in every student with a team approach. So with that data, I'd also like to invite Tim up here to share our annual results from last year. Thank you. And again, I uh, just want to begin by just saying how privileged we are to be working and partnering with um, Emmaus High School and East Penn School District. Um, when Tammy went through and talked about the integrated student supports that we provide, every year after a needs assessment, what we do is we identify um, 
goals for the school. This year's goals were improving social emotional learning, reducing student suspensions, again a behavioral uh, measurement, and reducing chronic absenteeism. Um, also, just want to make note that uh, CIS serves in eight high schools in six different school districts. We have a scholarship, and last year we awarded it to one of the students here at Emmaus High School. And that student, her own journey was, was really quite remarkable. Um, she had been uh, struggling with anxiety, depression, PTSD, suicidal ideation herself. Um, she took part in one-to-one -one case management with her psych coordinator, Tammy. Uh, she was participated in some of the group work, um, and she really improved uh, her coping skills, her ability to manage her anxiety, um, and um, graduated with a 3.0 grade point average, and, um, and her life is really looking uh, much better and uh, really setting her up for a bright future. Our end of year results here at Emmaus High School. Uh, first, I just want to say that in those tier one, which is the whole school supports, uh, 2,600 students were reached. Um, sometimes that might be a one-time connection, but um, uh, through CIS services, 2,600 received some level of service. 68 of those students um, received the one-to-one -one intensive case managed support. And of that 68, 60 uh, received um, a dosage of at least 45 days. And again, our results, our stay in school rate, um, that's something that communities and schools and every one of our affiliates around the country measures. 96% uh, of those at-risk students um, stayed in school, which is, again, uh, a very high number. Um, and again, I just want you to keep in mind that when we work with a case-managed student, uh, that student has exhibited at least one risk factor uh, that has been referred to us. And so every one of these students has um, a number of risks going on in their lives. Um, graduation rate, which means the seniors that we're working with who start the school year and finish graduating, 72% uh, of our seniors uh, completed. Uh, a promotion rate, 84%. And again, our three indicators, improving attendance, 74%, improving behavior, 60%, and improving academics, 59%. Uh, so those are the results of our 68 case managed students. Is Linda? So that concludes the first portion of this presentation. Are there any questions? Dr. Levinson? <clears throat> yes, on slide uh, 16, uh, with, with the end of year results. Oh. Oh, wow. This one. There you go. So those percent, a lot of those percentages aren't, aren't at 100%. So I don't know if, if, that, if that's considered negative outcomes or works in progress. Um, I'm just curious. If, a, if you know, the identified student uh, you know, has an improved behavior, for instance, is that students stay with the program will eventually? Can you say that question, the last part again? Sure. So for example, for um, improved behavior um, at 60%, if there's a student that has, hasn't yet improved behavior, does that student stay in the program until eventually they succeed so that we eventually capture this and get closer to 100%? Yes, once a student is um, referred to me, um, they stay with me for um, the remainder of their of their time as long as there is a consent form in place every year. So we continue to work with them. The first year, and especially on the, the behavior, is really the area of concern where you really need to build that rapport and that trust with the student, and it's, it's a difficult uh, a difficult area to address so that sometimes does take a little longer but yes they will always remain with us 
Um, we have in other districts students that actually are in the middle schools and when they transition to the high school they're case managed in the middle school and they're just automatically on our on our caseload in the high school which makes for a great transition the student has already knows the routine they know groups they know what the case manager is doing there's a buy-in with the parent so it's a really smooth transition when that happens so we keep them as long as they're willing to stay okay thank you mm -hmm. uh, mr. Ballard uh, yes, I have a couple of questions on this slide also. Um, first of all, that number 2,600 seems to be more than we currently have enrolled in the high school. Could you explain where that number comes from? Um, I believe that that was the, the number that at the time uh, where we get our those uh, that data from at the beginning of the school year, I believe uh, that was the number at that time. So we, we go to uh, PA school performance when we're doing our, our planning for the year. The, the current number, uh, Mr. Ballard, is 2,761 for the enrollment from the latest report. Okay. Um, and the uh, 68 students out of the 2,600 or whatever, 2,700, mm -hmm. uh, those are the ones that have required 45 days or more of case management? Right. Those are the ones that are referred through their school counselor that are identified as um, high, high needs. They are the ones that may present with the anxiety, the depression, um, chronic absenteeism, uh, grades suffering so then they're referred um, in consultation with the um, assistant the assistant principals they um, are referred to me and then at that point like I said there were about a hundred and some referrals the students come and go so all in all the, it was the 68 that were I think the 60 were 50 45 days or more which is a marking period that's how we measure Okay, so the 2,500 to 2,600 students, depending which number you pick, that are not in that 68, they were served by the generic programs that you put on. Right, the tier ones, the school-wide, like the uh, mental health awareness uh, campaign, the attendance awareness campaign, um, yoga being offered uh, school-wide who, for whomever is interested, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Ms. Bowman? Um, let's go closer. I, I um, had the opportunity to attend the mental health symposium, if that's the right language, and um, I, it was excellent, and I do hope you offer it again, and I, I think it's great when we can um, help families uh, learn how to better deal with um, what's going on with their children. Um, I do have a question about the slide, I don't remember which slide it is, but the one that shows the rates of um, different mental health issues that our students have, whether it's self-harm, suicidal ideation, yes. Um, and are we helping all of the um, students who are presenting with suicidal ideation and self-harm within the caseload that you have or are some of those students sadly on the waiting list any student that comes to the office and reports suicidal ideation or self self-harm becomes an immediate priority and they are it is addressed if they come to me if it's a student that's on that's on my caseload I uh, work in conjunction with the school psychologist and they are immediately evaluated with a, a risk assessment there are not um, any students that have an immediate need like that that are that are that it where it's not addressed there are students on the caseload on our wait list that may be having um, anxiety or some of the other issues um, and um, you know maybe suffering grades that type of thing um, 
and they, yes, unfortunately, they are on the wait list. We do always say that students are able to um, participate in our in our groups, but I can't always get to them as far as case managing one on one. More than when they're when they're um, in group. They are minimally case managed, which is a minimum of once a month, but it's more like a, just to check in to see how they're doing. It's not that intensive case management that I do with the student that's actually on my case vote. Um, which kind of leads to a follow-up question. So you are triaging them. I, I'm wondering if you can explain that process of, I, I, you started to explain it just now that some um, students are, prioritized to go, I'm not sure if I'm using the right words, but okay. to go first, based on what's going on um, in their lives or in, with their mental health. Um, and, and how are those choices made in terms of which students are brought into the program versus which students are on the waiting list? Well, the wait list, it's, it's more of just a chronological thing. When, when, once my wait list, once my case load gets to a certain, a certain place, which is generally about 60, 55 to, to 60, is where we where we cut it off at that point because then I feel that the quality of my service is not as good as it as it could be otherwise. So we cut it off at that point. But um, so then it's just a matter of the wait list is really just a chronological um, thing. But in order for a student to um, to qualify for the services, they um, have those as I address the the non academic uh, risk factors that are created issues um, with them succeeding academically whether that's it whether it's showing up behaviorally um, chronic absenteeism or or academic wise and, and um, I have so many questions but I'll just ask them more <laughs> and let other board members ask more um, how do you assess or measure the absenteeism is there a number that turns an, is there a normal amount of sick days and then it becomes chronic after a certain number I was just yes it becomes chronic if it's if they are um, absent more than 10% of, of the school days so for instance 45 days in a marking period if they're absent five times they're considered chronically absent throughout the school year the 180 days if they're absent 18 okay. or more times they're considered chronic thank you sure Dr. Munson? Uh, yes, so, so first of all, thank you for this presentation and also the presentation that we got last year from Dr. Pekarik and others. I feel like I've learned quite a bit about both the breadth and the depth um, of the need um, in the community via the schools um, for this and the sort of the reality of how hard it is to provide an education when um, you're dealing with so many students that have such significant um, non-academic issues that they need to overcome. So thank you all um, who work on that. I, I appreciate it. Um, I, a couple of uh, questions. One is, I guess we're all obsessed with your caseload. <laughs> I'm trying to just figure so, out these so numbers I. from this slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you see the, the slide, I guess it's slide, uh, I've got old man eyes, so I can't, um, seven, slide, slide seven. Um, it, it says that you're, you currently have 68 students on your caseload. But when right. I, the math leaves some students out on here. So you've, you've had 116 referrals, and if you subtract out everyone that is, else that's listed there, those who transferred, withdrew, refused, you, unsuc you were unsuccessful in uh, reaching them, the people are on the wait list, we're still down by about a dozen students. And I'm curious what, where are those, like who are those students, what are, where do they, well, it could very well be just my math, to be honest with you. <laughs> but they they fall they fall under one of one of or the other of, of those categories. The sixty eight students are the ones that I actively am working with that are here enrolled in in school, and I'm working with them. Um, the withdrawals. I would have to go back over the math. I mean, I can certainly you know I mean, look, at, look at I, it. I mean, yeah. It, are there some that actually um, don't need the services for an extended period of time, so they would be a referral, but then not be a current caseload because their their issues are resolved? 
or is that not They've graduated from the, the, yeah we for the most part the student remains again unless the parent determines maybe the following year that the student is doing better and doesn't need the service or they've now accessed outside services and they feel that's sufficient so it could very well be a math I thought I double checked my math but I'm, I'm a social worker math is not my is not my specialty I'm sorry I apologize okay but the, the principle is that every student would be accounted for in these categories. There isn't some other category of student that is either no longer no. need of service or is uh, you know, no. left out or... If they, were, if they were not in need of service say in the beginning of the year, they would have never gotten a consent form. I wouldn't have a consent form for them, so they wouldn't have been counted in the numbers to begin with. Okay. okay. Great. Um, so I think f at least f from where, like what my role is... Uh, or what I see my role is on, on this board. Well, the, one of the most useful um, slides is slide 12. All right, let's try 12. <laughs> Those numbers are really small. Yeah, um, okay. which sort of tells us sort of what, sort of how the program has done um, mm -hmm. in the district relative to these um, these different standards, I guess, um, or ways in which you're measuring. Mm -hmm. But I actually, I'm actually finding it difficult to connect this results slide with the goals slide that you had earlier for the district, which was there were three goals, but they don't actually match the three things that you are measuring success on. Right. Those are school-wide goals. That's the overall school. Improving social-emotional learning throughout the school. Right. Reducing chronic absenteeism through, throughout the school. We measure, we measure school-wide data as well as data for individualized case-managed students. And do we have any data on whether or not we have, that we have, in fact, over the last two years, reduced chronic absenteeism? or reduce student suspension or improve social emotional learning we we do um, that was um, addressed I believe it's addressed at the end of the year once our annual results come out um, and at we do have those it is something that I measure every year absolutely okay I, I yeah. mean if, if that's if it's that this is a mid-year report and we get a final report that, right. that, right. that seems reasonable I, I would I mean I would submit that it would be, that it would be useful to have that information um, Yes. And, and just a reminder, the school-wide goals are derived from that need survey that we do every year in the summer. That's fine. I, no, I wasn't... No. The goals are the goals. They, they look like great goals. I, I'm just <laughs> curious if CIS is helping us meet those goals. And one thing that would be useful to know is, has since CIS has focused on reducing chronic absenteeism, has, in fact, chronic absenteeism gone down? Um, so, it, I mean, it's a, a relatively simple question. I know it, you've got to get data to do that, right. but it would be right. useful to know that. Um, and then I, my, my last question, and maybe it's for both of you, it's the same question I asked when we were contemplating, uh, you know, bringing in communities and schools in the first place. And I, it is still unclear to me what the division of labor is between communities and schools on the one hand as an outside provider um, and um, and the the district employees um, like the school psychologists and counselors <coughs> and this is especially relevant given that later on our agenda tonight we're talking about hiring you know at least one such person, um, another uh, psychologist. So when we talk about the number of incidents um, of these various negative um, mental and emotional health um, issues, do you see all of them? Do you take some of them and the psychologists take others? So are, are our psychologists <laughs> running some of these groups? So I'll speak to some of that. So the school psychologist that's in the budget is at the elementary level. So that does not impact the middle level or the high school level. Um, so that's important to kind of remember. Uh, the school psychologists handle all of the crisis intervention, so to speak. So if a student comes in with suicide ideation into the counseling office, they may see the guidance counselor first. And then if there is um, you know, an issue where there's a real problem with that immediate assessment it goes to the school psychologist for a risk assessment 
So if those two folks aren't available, then Tammy would take that risk assessment for the student that is only on her caseload. So she would not see any of kind of the general population that is experiencing a crisis. Okay. Can I clarify? And so, go ahead. Can yes. I, clarify that? Go ahead. I, I actually, I actually do not do the risk assessments, not because I'm not qualified to do them, but because the district had said that they would prefer that a district employee do the do the risk assessment. So if they do come to me and the school psychologist is not available, then we have a a list of the other school psychologists, the, the protocol who we should call next, and we'll call someone from from the middle school or to come over and do the risk assessment. So the school psychologists do risk assessment. Right. And they do um, uh, they do emergency intervention. So do they, do they do more? Do they address more chronic concerns, or is that all done by CIS? Can you clarify what you mean by chronic? I'm, I'm, I, so I'm, if it's a repeated situation, or are you talking about like a suicide ideation? I'm trying to understand um, what the division of labor is between the school psychologists and CIS. And so one thing you said, one difference you, you noted was that it's the school psychologists that do the risk assessments. Correct. Not CIS. Correct. Uh, right? And it's the school psychologists that deal with suicidal ideation. Correct. Not CIS unless they really have to. Correct. Are there any other differences or, or, or is are our school psychologists involved in um, you know meeting with groups of students or dealing with any ongoing issues or or is their role limited to risk assessment and uh, suicidal ideation intervention so as far as the mental health piece goes yes you are correct um, some of our school psychologists do run groups um, with the emotional support students so at the middle level the school psychologists would get involved with a particular program as well as at the high school and the elementary level and so what would determine if, if a student was in a group with CIS or a group with a school psychologist so do you want to talk to that? Well, so, I can really only, really only speak to what we do at the high school and the school psychologist doesn't run groups. I'm the one that coordinates the groups with the outside agencies. Um, but I can say that with CIS being there, we are able to work much more intensively with with the students. Um, it kind of relieves the, um, I don't want to say the burden, but the, the caseload of the counselors as well as the school psychologist where they have, their caseload is much larger than what mine is. As you see, 68 students as opposed to 300 and something so I'm able to meet with students once a week sometimes twice a week sometimes every day in some cases so it, it's much more intensive and that really takes um, away the, the time that those counselors otherwise those students would be coming down seeking seeking out their assistance where I'm there and I'm able to to work with them and they're able to move on to their 300 other students okay so so that that's actually helpful it is just let me repeat it back in different words to make sure I'm understanding so then one of the other differences is that you're dealing with a smaller subset of students that have more intensive needs yes and school psychologists are dealing with a larger number of students whose needs aren't as intensive well their needs when it gets to the level of the school psychologist in addition to her other duties I don't want to make it sound like she's not doing anything else but where I come in is if a student comes to me, a student on my caseload, or any of the counselors, there's a, a student that says they're they're having suicidal ideation. It would it goes to the school psychologist right then. Once that risk assessment is done, and if it is my student, I do sit in in on the assessment because sometimes I have a better a better um, closer relationship with the student than the school psychologist would because I know I know them better. Um, so what happens at that time is then she would determine whether or not that student needs to immediately go to the hospital, whether or not there's um, 
maybe not that much of a pressing need, but maybe a parent needs to be called and the student needs to make an emergency appointment with their therapist. There are different things depending on what the outcome of the risk assessment is. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you for this information. It's uh, very uh, useful, and thank you for all the work that you do um, in the schools. Um, I Just uh, to support what Dr. Munson said about slide 12, that was very imp uh, important or helpful for me to, to gauge progress. But uh, as I look past that to slide 14 and a lot of the other data in the presentation, it's very, um, it's a lot of raw numbers. And I was hoping, and I have a couple questions here, a couple parts of my question, that you could help me um, if possible, um, identify some trends in the data that we're seeing and help me understand what we're looking at here. Um, as a visual learner and the other visual learners in the room, I, I'm sure will appreciate this. This is very helpful for me to see from one year to the next. Um, and, I, and I totally understand that this is two different amounts of time. So that's a big part of the difference that we see in some of the numbers here. But um, when I if let's take a, a pick any number, let's say it goes down from one from last year to this year. I'm hoping that you can help me understand what that means, and maybe you can't because uh, it's just raw data at this point. But if a number were to go down from last year to this year, there's a couple of good things I can see that being. And I can also see a possible negative as well. If a number is going down, is it because we are doing a good a better job at meeting the students' needs? Or is it because there's less demand for those particular services? Or is there a negative associated with it in that we're not identifying enough students who have those particular challenges? Can we extrapolate from data like this any kind of conclusions in that regard? I think, as you indicated, it's very difficult to know for certain. I mean, one of the areas that wasn't mentioned but is, is definitely a factor is you think about, too, the time that students are in the building with us. And this year has been sort of a random year as far as we've had a flood. And we had students out of school for a period of time. We've had snow days that have added to the increase in, um, you know, a decrease in the number of school days that we've seen our students so far. So I even think factors like that play a role into our numbers. I do think our approach to identifying students is getting better and better. And sometimes, you know, what's not necessarily indicated in this information here is that we may meet with a student once or twice and be able to address those issues in that first instance or the second instance. Where it gets to the level where it's being logged in our mental health and crisis log, those are uh, chronic repeat visits by the same students to us. So those are issues that were not able to be resolved within a once or twice visit to either the school psychologist or the school counselor. And a lot of times we, we resolve those issues in partnership with our parents and oftentimes we're able to help connect parents to other resources within the community that allow them to get the services that their students need in a much greater depth that we can provide at the school level for all 2,700 students um, in our building. So uh, to answer your question, I wish I had a, a, a better answer. I don't know that we'll ever know that. I'd like to believe that students do feel comfortable to approach any one of us. And, and I, I think that Part of the other answer to you know asking about the different roles and assignments is that we we try all to have a connection with any of our high risk students so whether that connection comes in the form of cis or the student school counselor or the student school psychologist we hope that we're making a connection with students who present with the mental health concerns i appreciate those comments um and to, to add to my previous question, you started your presentation reading a testimonial from a parent from many, many years ago who's, who said that these types of challenges were not present back then. And, and I know you spoke to the challenges of interpreting the data, but I'm hoping that we can get to a point where through your work and through this presentation, we can start to make some recommendations for what we can be doing to be more proactive. And I think you're probably going to get to that in a little bit. But um, how we can be more proactive in the sense that we can get to a point like those parents 20, 30 years ago who didn't have that need so that we don't need to have 
CIS and we don't need to have these supports in place because then our students are better off overall. So if we can get to a point where we can be more, more proactive in our in our response, and a lot of this is probably societal in general, not, mm -hmm. not necessarily specific to East Penn, but if there's any sort of recommendations that we can um, work towards to extra extrapolate from the data, mm -hmm. that would make, um, I think, our job as a board and really as educators um, and parents in a community um, much more powerful yeah thank you and, and I think I can just speak to unfortunately being involved in the mental health field I don't ever see it going away completely <laughs> I think the best thing that we can do is to increase our connections which is you know sort of what I alluded to and the more connections we can have for students in any form we will see continued success in working with those students but I don't know that we'll ever see negative data that we don't have a need okay. thank you Mr. Cunningham, I mean, Mr. That's okay. Mr. Champagne, <laughs> you too. <Yeah. laughs> thank, you. thank you for your, your information. Um, just a couple of questions. On slide 15, which is kind of the overall scorecard you presented, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm struggling with a little bit, or 16, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I have old man eyes too, so. How, how do you look at those numbers and say, is that good outcomes? Is that expected outcomes? Is that not so good? I mean, what does it really, what do you, what do you, what does it suggest? What does it tell us? In, especially with the yeah, outcomes like of the like case managed students. I mean, is that better than you're seeing in other schools or worse? I mean, what is kind of the, what is it really, what is it really trying to say to us? I think one of the things, um, every time we go into a new school, it's a new setting. Um, I can say this, organizationally, we're, we are about 70% every year in the three indicators, attendance, behavior, and academics. But I think where the value of this is going to come in is in the comparison from year to year. You know, this this becomes a, a year one benchmark, and I think we can begin to measure progress by comparing to the year one. It, it's you know, remembering that we are when we are case managing students, we're dealing with the most difficult situations in the school. Um, so um, progress is something we really have to work hard for. Um, so uh, I, I hope that helps a little bit. That does because it, you know it is. You're right. It is the first year, and I. But I don't know how to interpret what it what is telling us. And I think you're saying okay, you want to obviously a trend, and I agree with that. And if 70 percent is kind of where you're seeing it on a more long term average across maybe the entire, I don't know the, the, this area or the nation or whatever, that gives me some sense. Okay, we you know if we're not moving toward that you know direction then there are some things we need to, to kind of reassess sure um, just a couple of other quick questions when you talk about the waiting list I know you said it was in chronological order how long are students on that wait list is it a month is it a week is it six months you know is are we seeing you know some kids that really need some services are just hanging on for a long period of time yeah, I do have some students on, on my caseload um, for quite some time just because of the um, you know, the cap that I need to put on, on the caseload and being only one person in the school, I... Well, I understand that. Yeah, but, but they are, yeah, they are there. How long are we seeing those kids hanging out, though, that are on that wait list? Um, is it a month? You know, are they, sure. if they come in chronological yeah. order... You know, is it like from the beginning of the year and now you're still on the wait list? Is, so I'm just trying to get a feel for how quickly we're moving through that wait list. And I'll let Tammy address how quickly we're moving through, but I do want to make mention that we don't leave those kids out to just hang out there, that even though they don't move to Tammy's wait list, they are still being seen every time they come to the office by their school counselor or by the school psychologist. So we, we never want to give the impression that just because they're more intensive and they might not make it to Tammy's wait or make it to Tammy's caseload that they're not being served. We absolutely are serving those students in other capacities to the best of our abilities while they remain on the wait list. Okay. 
and as far as the wait list um, moving moving students off again it really just depends on whether a student if someone transfers out of the district then I automatically move the next student on uh, it's just it's really hard to predict how long it is there there's no there's no set answer for that but I can say they're getting support which is like right they are they are getting support absolutely make sure that we're not just leaving somebody no now we've had maybe total about maybe 30 students on the caseload and now we're at 15 so there have been some okay. that have moved off absolutely okay thank you yep uh, mr. Flanders yeah um, so getting back to some of the discussions around the trends and that we have two data points and of course <laughs> when you have two data points you can not really draw a whole lot of conclusions to something I'd, I'd say that you know it's really going to take that third and fourth year before you can start to say anything about the trends but I think that one of the advantages of having an organization like communities and schools is not just that you are at East Penn but you are across the valley you are nationwide and so so I think what one of the things that this board is asking for is if we know we're getting better because we can compare to other schools or other districts that have similar demographics or you know kind of look like us to say communities and schools has been here for six years and we've done this and you are comparison like that and that way we can start to get a sense of ah okay after two years yes we're on the right track or wait something's going off here and we can pay attention to that so I think that at a future presentation that would be extremely valuable information um, another thing that I think would be really valuable in a future presentation sounds like the board is asking for what is a day in the life of a guidance counselor and a school psychologist what do they do all day how do they take up their time I know they're busy but what are they doing and then why is it why is that need for communities and schools there because yes we've got a fairly good idea of what the communities and schools rep does all day and it's pretty intense what are the other folks doing that you know they say okay this is how that all fits together and this is how it all works thank you I appreciate that question if you go back to I think it was the January 28th school board meeting um, when we talked about the budget priorities and we talked about the counselor as well as the school psychologist so that kind of encapsulates encapsulated you know most of the duties I would say um, but we certainly could by level like high school middle and elementary outline that a little better for everyone Sure, go ahead. I, I think I can speak on as absolutely on this uh, part of the counselor. I think one of the most important things to remember is under the ASCA model, which is the American School Counselor Association model, we're really responsible for delivering three domains to students, and that's academic, personal, social, and career. So our duties really ex extend beyond just the social emotional piece that you know is needed for our students to be successful. And while we spend quite a bit of time on the social emotional piece it would we would be remiss if we were not addressing the career piece which as we all know that the state has really begun to put more and more emphasis on career readiness for students at all levels elementary middle and high school so there's an increased focus in that area in addition to the academic planning and preparation for students so helping them determine what future career goals and how their course curriculum aligns with those goals so you know just without going too much in, in detail of what a day in the life of the school counselor looks like I think it's really important to remember that our services and the delivery of our services extend well beyond the social emotional piece that we're talking about today Ms. Bowen. Um, I'd just like to ask a more global question um, it's very obvious from this presentation that you're doing good work and it's sorely needed and um, saving a lot of students who otherwise um, may have um, somewhat desperately fallen through the cracks um, due to really everybody having <laughs> caseloads that are unbelievably too full um, but I do um, I'm thinking about the letter that you read from the parent who said we didn't have these problems 30 years ago and also about reports of epidemic depression epidemic anxiety um, uh, somewhat pointing to how much we're pushing kids more than we ever have um, maybe there's other factors I, I feel like when we put things like this in place and obviously we need to have them in place 
but it's like a band-aid and we're not fixing the underlying problem. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about what some of these underlying problems are that we as a board or as a district should start looking at addressing so that we can start driving down these epidemic levels of depression and anxiety um, without continually hiring more and more people to um, meet students um, so, um, the right word's failing me, but so often, I guess. So I think, you know, the first thing that I could speak to regarding your question is I think it's really important to have that tiered level of support. And so, you know, when you look at the CIS model or any MTSS model, you look at tier one as reaching all students, regardless of behavior academics. And tier two, it's more of like an augmented support. So those students that aren't yet in crisis kind of learn, you know, how to deal with depression, anxiety, and, and getting them the help that they need, whether it's, you know, counseling outside of the district, um, you know, whether it's counseling in the district by a school psychologist if they have an IEP. Um, so I think it really is, you know, augmenting what we're doing now because I think this is an epidemic, not only in our district, but really nationwide. So I don't know if I, you know, have an answer for you with regard to the origin of it, but, you know, it's certainly something that we constantly constantly, you know, are looking at. All right, well, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for your presentation and your answers Not to our questions. Not finished yet. <laughs> Part two. Part two. <laughs> Okay, so as the chair of the Behavior Support Subcommittee, I continue to monitor student needs district-wide with my colleagues. And if you recall, back in 2016, the original proposal for CIS um, services was to include a person at the high school as well as someone to service the middle school. And at that point in time, due to the district priorities, uh, the decision was made to support one site coordinator um, where we saw the greatest need, and that was at Emmaus High School. Um, if you look at the middle level data, you will see that there are 272 total incident reports, and that is from August 2018 to March 2019. And again, we see the highest level of incident um, in anxiety anxiety, suicidal, ideation, and not far behind that is depression. So there really is a need to augment our supports at IR and LMMS. I would now like to introduce Mike McCorston, who is going to share a promising opportunity um, for our district. Um, but I'd really just like you to see the current middle level supports that we have in place right now. And even with all of those supports, um, we're not meeting student needs. And I also articulated the ratio of the school psychologists and counselors uh, at that middle level. Thank you. Uh, I just want to offer two comments before uh, I get into the Challenge School grant opportunity. Being part of a national organization, there's about 165 affiliates across the country doing similar work, and it allows us to engage with them and see what issues they're facing. And unfortunately, the mental health, anxiety, depression is something that across this country that every affiliate that we work closely with is experiencing, and it's it's. Uh, resources are just scarce in a lot of communities. Um, two, when looking at data, we're an organization that does look at data from a quarterly and annual um, basis just to see where our progress is, um, even down to the student level progress in academics, course performance, and attendance. What I will say is for all the schools that we've have started here within the districts we work with, the year one results for a first year school, um, Emmaus High School is much higher than what we typically see in, the, in a first year school. So I just want to offer that little bit of feedback, but I do appreciate the comments to looking at comparative demographics um, in some other communities which we may be able to find. 
So my job is to share an interesting opportunity. So our national um, office's uh, strategic plan calls for growth. They like to see us serve more students across the country, and they're looking to serve about 300,000 more students within the next several years. And one of the values of being part of a national organization is that they have the ability to leverage resources and partnerships across the country that would not be available to a small affiliate in Lehigh Valley and Berks area. And they're able to raise millions of dollars that they want to invest within our affiliates. And they opened up a competitive RFP process that was available to 165 affiliates. And uh, our organization did apply. Um, and we were one of about 12 affiliates across the country that was awarded. With that, we reached out to five of our current districts to share the opportunity to see if there was a need and interest. And what was unique about it was there was a commitment through our national office to provide three years of support, 40% uh, of funding to support the expansion of the model that you just received a presentation on. So with that award, uh, we have the opportunity, once we um, firm up our commitments with our district partners and get approvals, to go into 11 schools um, as of July 1st, um, expanding our reach within elementary, three middle, and one high school. So what this opportunity provides, it provides access to services. Uh, we've just received a report on the demonstrated need and it's access in the middle school level. So pushing services down lower into grade levels, intervening earlier, and also providing an opportunity to provide transitional support, which is one area that students struggle with significantly when they transition from one school, uh, one grade level school to the next. That's when kids tend to, to experience some difficulties during that transition piece. Financial support uh, through this, uh, our organization will be able to provide $192,000 in support to this project that will benefit the East Penn um, schools and community. And with our model alignment, so once we go through that process every year, when we identify what those school-wide supports are, um, we're able to tailor the evidence-based program to those supports. So as the needs evolve and change within the community in the next three years, um, it's not a cookie cutter program that's being pushed in. It can really be molded to whatever the needs are and the changing needs of each school. Um, we're looking obviously through all our work is to see increased student uh, success um, as we implement our evidence-based program. And one thing I want to point out with this is there is um, demonstrated impacts. So our national office does a really good job of doing research and has an innovation lab about best practices um, and providing those supports to us and training and and all the evidence that the model really works. But through this project, we have an opportunity to do a localized study. Um, they're really looking for the awarded affiliates in this grant to participate in a research practice research study over the three years, which will result in demonstrating the impact of having uh, CIS or not. So there's a real opportunity to maybe have a localized study to demonstrate the return on the investment from the community and the actual impact within the schools. Um, so it's a little bit different. So I just wanted to go over the next steps. Um, the contract for the CIS grant will appear on the May 11th school board agenda. And what that means is that you would be committing to three years um, beginning with 2019, um, implementation July 1st, 2019, and CIS would continue at both middle schools for 2020, 21, 21, 22. Um, that would give us a site coordinator at Iyer Middle School as well as LMMS. And so the financial obligation to the district would be to provide an estimated $96,000 of funding for the project for each year for the three years, totaling $288,000 over the three years. And as Mike said, CIS would uh, support us with $192,000 over the three years. Any additional questions or comments? Mr. Smith? Just real quick on a slide 18. 
look, comparing um, LMMS to IRE in future presentations, can we have those numbers as percentages because we're talking about different size holes? Sure. Thank sure. You. Um, Mr. Champagne? Yeah, I guess not knowing enough about you know the the impact of at the high school you know i think we've gotten some better information so it, it sounds like it's going to take a number of years at the high school to get up to speed so now what i'm seeing is we're asked to commit at the at the middle school for three years and i don't know if the ninety six thousand dollars is in our budget uh for the coming year but then if it's going to take three four five six years to really see results in effect, we're, we're starting something on a subsidized basis, but after three years, it's no longer subsidized, and we're now gonna be faced with $160,000 obligation per year. So I guess I'm, I'm sympathetic to the issue, mm -hmm. but I'm a little concerned about the economics of the, the pro proposition, given that we're you know, approving, or potentially approving, a significant number of additional district priorities so where does this fit in the district priorities that we've all been going through for the last three months and this is coming in and now all of a sudden on May 11th we're going to be asked to approve a contract so I'm a little I'm struggling with that if this had been a district priority I would have thought it would have risen to that level of discussion that we've had over the last several months so I totally understand where you're coming from. Uh, I think this has always been a priority, but you know, as we had to before with determining need with high school versus middle school, you know, this kind of fell, I don't want to say, you know, not at the bottom, but it was a lower priority. Um, you know, we look at this as an opportunity for the district to put those services in place for basically half the price of what we would be paying, you know, if we would have come to you to say we want the full dollar amount um, and again I, I remind you that we can cancel you know the CIS contracts it's not like we're asking for someone um, you know that will be an employee of ours that we will have to sustain that cost over time and have that be a reoccurring cost well I recognize we can cancel a contract but I guess we're looking to improve the lives of students and we start something and if we you know carrying it on for three years we may see some positive results we may not but we're then asked being asked to decide you know again are we going to commit the additional funding and I guess is this priority higher than the priority if you looked at the guidance counselor the, the psychologist the staff assistant any of those individuals that you've identified where does this rank above that below that in the middle do we need to take one of those out because I, I guess I'm struggling with how this all now fits into the budget mm -hmm. that we're looking to approve okay. Talk to the budget. <laughs> yeah, I am, um, and I appreciate that the timing of this. Um, certainly, the timing was not ideal because we came to the board with our budget presentations, and you know that we worked very hard over um, several months to provide details regarding those needs. Um, in terms of, to answer your question, our priorities are still as they originally were in the budget presentation. And so you'll notice that our budget, our, our priorities, when we talk about social emotional learning, we really did identify the school counselor and the school psychologist as priorities. And as you learned in tonight's presentation, those really are tier one supports. Um, those supports that we would put in place that service all kids in our buildings. Um, having said that, what then happened is certainly social emotional learning mental health is it was not a tier it was not one of the top priorities that came to um, our board this year however clearly you know that we have um, a concern and a desire to continue address social emotional learning and mental health needs in our district and the, the timing of being notified that we were eligible for the grant came very recently and so we're now at the situation of providing the update with regard to the high school data presenting the board with the opportunity to accept the grant which would allow us to service two middle schools um, certainly at a reduced cost for three years but I recognize it's about then sustainability of a program as well mm -hmm. 
I guess the, the question I haven't heard is, how does it fit in the budget? I haven't heard that answer. Right, so it, it is not, the one of the questions you ask is, is it presently in the budget? It is not presently in the budget. So between now and May 13th, 13th, 13th we would need, you know, as we do the, the, you know, another look at the budget, we would need to evaluate how to work that into the budget. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Ballard? Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I have to say that no one should uh, infer or imply that I'm making any criticism of the needs for the program, the program quality, or the effort of any of the individuals involved in the program. Um, I have some of the, the had some of the same concerns as uh, Mr. Champagne about where in the budget this would come from, presuming we would not try to increase the uh, the tax increase or, or whatever, but where it would come from. Uh, but then I have several questions for the administration regarding um, the whole subject of this, because I'm getting more and more concerned about the rhetoric that is going around on this kind of program. Um, <laughs> Ms. Mrs. Campbell, um, is any of this program mandated by federal or state law or regulation? No. Okay. The phrase that I heard echoed tonight was basically mental, community mental health, and then juxtaposed with in the community via the schools and my concern would be what do I say to or what would you recommend that I say to someone who comes to me and says community mental health is not the mission of the school district uh, that we are not mandated to do that and community mental health is a serious enough issue that it should be something that is handled on a community-wide basis, which means that it is financed by something other than school property tax. So your question is, how, how, sh how should or how would I suggest that you respond if asked that question? Yes. And I appreciate your question, and I, I actually think we've, I think the board potentially had this, um, this same discussion in previous year, in the previous year when we talked about communities and schools. I think we have an obligation to um, do our very best job educating all kids, and we know that some kids will come to us with mental health needs. And if we don't first address those mental health needs, some of which are very significant, we know that we can't even get at the academic needs that they have. Well, the, the number of students involved, when you take a look at 2,700 in the high school alone, and we're talking about 68 on a long-term program and others in programs that are basically uh, tier one on your presentations here tonight, um, and we're spending what looks like 500 to 1000 dollars per student on those 68 students with the additional cost of the basic their basic program you look at that and ask you know how far down into the percentage population is the school obligated either ethically morally or legally to go to fund those particular problems. Uh, as I said, community mental health is a widespread problem ranging from the op opioid crisis, which we're trying to fight on a community level, to uh, mental health in school because of the increased uh, stresses of modern life. And the question is, at what point does the school switch from being an educational institution to a social welfare institution? 
and there are many constituents of this board who have a problem with any tax increase, as I've known for many years, no matter what the admirable goal, I mean, everything we do is for the kids. That's not a sufficient justification for each additional new program that we need it for the kids because everything we do, we've got a, a problem with finances that we have to prioritize what we do for the kids. And the question I'm trying to get some uh, advice or uh, talking point from or from you is how do we make the argument that this program is any more necessary than any other program, number one. And number two, when, when you look at the amount of money spent and I say, well, gee, for that amount of money, I could pay for every student in the school school system to take the PSAT and the SAT and all of the advanced placement tests, which would actually be something that's directly uh, related to educational equity for all of the uh, 25 or 30 percent now we have a free and reduced lunch students in the district and I could see an immediate educational benefit and then also uh, direct link to education for that kind of expenditure where this expenditure is community mental health which is <laughs> while it can be related to education through the process that you just described it is not a direct mission of the school so I'm trying to find out what the rationale is for that particular uh, approach. I would uh, perhaps draw an analogy to uh, before we instituted the school-wide full-day kindergarten, we had full-day kindergarten for select populations of students that came to us not really prepared to um, participate in our, um, our kindergarten and be prepared to be in the first grade and we expended um, I would say more funds on the students that needed that additional um, support I would say in this what I I did not um, pick up from the presentation that we're trying to solve a community mental health problem I took from it that we're trying to solve, I mean, I think the term was non-academic barriers to ac academic performance. And so kids come not prepared to, to be able to um, learn to their full extent. And I do view this as an academic support uh, from that standpoint, we're not trying to make overall health of the community, mental health of the community better. We're trying to um, address barriers to learning um, from that specific uh, populations of students have. Well, I understand what your argument is, Mr. Bacher, but um, that is not an answer to my question. And uh, I don't think the analogy of uh, full day kindergarten <laughs> Uh, is appropriate under the circumstances of a particular educational argument. It's a question of whether or not this is a community mental health service, which it is. I don't think and that's how it's been would, presented. Would you stop interrupting me, Mr. Bacher, okay? You're taking advantage of the I'm president's sorry. position to argue your position, and I don't appreciate it. Okay. I'm trying to get somebody to tell me how we argue that we should provide community mental health services in the school setting financed by property taxes. I don't know that this will directly answer your question, Mr. Ballard, but I think the one piece of information as well that I would share with the community is that our district administration and teachers have been carefully monitoring the number of mental health crises that our students are presenting daily when they are here with us. And we know that their mental state is absolutely a barrier to their learning. And so I do believe that we as educators have 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 an obligation to respond and to to 
provide them with services and connect the students and or their families with services so that those mental health needs can be appropriately addressed and we can certainly get to working on some of the behavioral, working on the academics. Okay, thanks for your answer. Uh, Ms. Bowman? Um, I, uh, Mr. Ballard's question was actually um, similar to the question I was trying to ask before about the underlying causes. Um, I fully appreciate actually that students can't learn when they're depressed, anxious, or have um, other severe mental health issues that need to be treated. Um, similarly, we know that students can't learn when they're hungry and that's why we have a free and reduced lunch program. Um, and there's probably other examples. But um, I wasn't here for the first presentation of communities and schools and so um, I feel like I need more information about the program in order to make a decision of whether to expand it. And one of my main questions is whether we can't provide more help for our students through existing structures within the school, for example, through physical education classes, um, through health classes, and I'm not sure exactly what else, but um, one of the things that the communities and schools is doing as a tier one in the high school is a yoga class which struck me as something that could be offered during a physical education class and um, mindfulness seems like something that could be offered in a health class and actually reach more students so it it makes me wonder why we're not doing it on a more school-wide level reaching more students earlier and also um, trying to get at what's behind the epidemic so that um, obviously um, there's some things that are way out of the control of the school district for instance kids coming in with trauma that has nothing to do with what the district's doing but are there things structurally within the district that are triggering these amounts of anxiety and depression in students um, for example pushing students too hard or something else that I wouldn't even think to ask about um, those are things that I would like to know before committing to bringing more staff, I mean, they're not staff, but more personnel into the schools um, that we're actually trying to solve the underlying problem that's, especially the underlying problem that is uh, something that's happening within the district, if that makes sense. All right. Yeah, we can certainly look to answer those questions prior to the May board meeting. Mr. Flanders? Yeah, I the way I'm thinking about this right now is that it's it's a it is a community problem but it manifests itself and shows itself at the school so the school district has a certain amount of obligation to deal with that and then the underlying question is at what level in what way how much does it cost where do we put it so getting to all those points and saying that's the debate that the board needs to have is to say we know it needs to be addressed so that all the students learn because one disruptive student can ruin the learning for another couple hundred. How do you make sure that that is addressed in the right way and at the most effective way so that everybody gets the help that they need and everybody gets the learning that they need? So I, I, that's the way I would summarize it is that we need to have a healthy debate about at what level and in what way and that's that's a something that would happen I, I, I really hope would happen and so I would just like to add to what you just said so we you talk about externalizing behaviors and so those students that are acting out but I think it's very very important to recognize there there are students that are internalizing and those are the students that are anxious experiencing anxiety and depression and and there is a correlation and a comorbidity between the gifted population and those students that experience anxiety and depression and that is very real in our district as well so you know I know we talk about you know funding for maybe you know some PSSAT testing and that sort of thing but if those students aren't ready to learn and take that test then the outcome is going to be poor Dr. Uh, Munson? Uh, yeah, I have, I, I feel um, a little, I mean, people have asked these sort of 
bigger philosophical questions about this program. So, but I'm going to be the chump that asks a very specific, concrete question about um, measurement and so forth because I, I, I am interested in, in how the district goes about thinking about need. Um, so when I look at this meta, uh, this middle school graph, um, it's a log of incidents, and you've been very clear that this isn't actually the number of students; it's the number of incidents. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a, a ballpark estimate of how many students are represented on this graph? I have that data. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I certainly will get you those numbers. I mean, that would be useful. I wouldn't want to misspeak. Yeah, I mean, in part because, you know, one of the things I learned today is that the caseload of a CIS manager is about 60, mm -hmm. give or take. And so it would be useful to know how many people, uh, how many of the students are likely to have at least some of their needs met um, based on this. I guess the other question I have is, again, with a, a graph that just shows incidents, um, the very next slide is however woefully inadequate our supports are, we do have extensive um, investment in providing supports already. And so my question would be, how do you judge or how do you know how many of the things from slide 18 are already being successfully managed by the supports that we have on slide 19 versus how much more we need, how much more and of what type of things we need? So I think, and I know you're asking for the specific number of students, which I don't have, but I think it's you know important to recognize that the need is still there. So regardless of the supports that are in place, we're still seeing high numbers of students going to the hospital, experiencing um, you know anxiety, suicide. We still have students um, specifically at the middle level that we need to place outside of the district because of. Um, you know how they are presenting and we don't have the supports in place so you know really the goal is again not to replace the supports that we have in place or what our personnel are doing it's really to augment what we're doing in order to support more students um, in, in a better way so what I guess maybe another way to put my question is I'm um it's unclear to me what success looks like and how we would know if we achieve, I mean, if we had unlimited funding, right, we could buy all kinds of things, all kinds of services, all kinds of expertise. How would we know if that succeeded or not? So, I mean, from a special ed perspective, I would look at the number of students that um, are having to place outside of the district, um, students with disabilities. I would look at the IEPs to see a reduction in the amount of uh, psychological counseling that we do as a related service. I'd like to see that come down. I'd look at um, the incidence of uh, reports to KNS truancy and reducing that. Um, so, you know, there are some measures that we could definitely look at. Okay, I mean, I, you're you're an expert, and and I am not. I wouldn't and, and say so, that. But so thank I, you. So you know, one of the things that's actually very useful is a sort of very clear definition of what success looks like mm -hmm. and uh, updates on the extent to which we're achieving it. Because, for, I mean, incidents, like it, it's a lot. These incidents are alarming. But they don't tell the story by themselves. And I guess what I'm looking for is um, guidance from people who know a thing or two about this mm -hmm. on how this can be interpreted in, in a way so we can differentiate emergency from a big problem and a big problem from a solution. So I think what you're asking for is looking at the, the students that have incidents and then pairing that with an outcome. So is that incident causing truancy? Is it causing, um, you know, them repeated visits to the hospital? Is it did that cause us to place a student out of the district? Actually, I, I'm, I'm not sure because I, I don't know enough okay. about what the best way to <laughs> well, measure I think it. I know what you're yeah, asking. I mean, I'm, for, I'm so. asking what do you think is the best way to measure these things and are we measuring them and, and then can the board see uh, those measurements? I mean, you know, I, I will say like one, the one, one factor that, that struck uh, me, which is not on the middle school slide, it's actually on the incident report for the high school. I mean, the number one, the number one incident 
um, I guess my eyes are drawn to the Family red, issues. which is the previous year, at least in the previous year, the number one incident. And it looks, yes, it's the, it's still the number one incident um, in um, the most recent year is, is family issues. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, which is not itself a mental health condition. Presumably, it means that it is it's a marker for uh, some kind of mental health um, condition. But there's nothing that the district's going to do that's going to make the that need go away. We can manage the need when it comes to the school, um, but uh, you know that seems much different than some of the other things. And um, and useful to think about, given that it is the number one thing mm -hmm. that's on this list so we can definitely clarify that Ms. Bowman. Just a quick follow-up question, and it's just based on something you said. Um, when we have to place a student outside of the district or the student has repeated hospitalizations, is there a cost to the district so that if that went down, um, there would be some sort of savings to offset the cost of the program? Yes, and so last year, I actually, at the end of the year, I was able to present that data that, um, you know, specifically for the high school, we were able to reduce the number of students that were placed outside and you know I did the cost associated with that the cost savings so I will do that again okay thank you um, Mr. Yes, uh, I just want to clarify something what I'm hearing is that basically we don't have enough staffing in the middle schools to uh, to take care of these issues is that's what I'm hearing right now or, or that is not the issue well I think you know if we were to, if we were able to add an additional counselor or an additional psychologist yes that would probably alleviate some of the issue but then again you have to look at that is a recurring cost and so once we bring that person on there are employee you know till they retire maybe and so that is one of the reasons why we went with communities and schools at the high school so that it would be a contracted position and if things got a lot better then we could say we don't need the service anymore and so that always is the goal to build the supports in place and build up our tier one two and three and be able to do it on our own thank you any other questions comments um, I would like to echo um, Mr. Champagne's and uh, Mr. Flanders comments on where does this fit in the budget and how does it impact the budget. Um, one other question I had that was partially answered in response to uh, Dr. Munson's comments was sort of what does this trial um, give us if we're in effect bringing this on and if it does well we're going to be um, keeping it it's almost like we're committing to something now I know we can cancel it mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like um, we will have the ability to sort of um, ascertain we put some metrics in place to say is this impacting um, things that we're doing now for the positive and maybe quantify that during this trial period to say does it make sense to us to continue it or um, that is accurate yes. so that's another aspect of uh, it allows us to try something at a, at a reduced cost I guess to see if it will that help works. in the long term are there any other comments by the Thank you very much. Thank for you. Thank you. Next is a report from the superintendent, Ms. Campbell. It's going to be late. Okay, throughout the week of March 18th, we completed our kindergarten registration in East Penn. Um, we registered 436 kindergartners for the 1920 school year as a frame of reference in March of 2018, so about a year ago during our previous year's registration, we registered about 30 fewer kids, 30 fewer students at 406 students. Um, when we look at our current elementary staffing, meaning we take our current elementary um, classes and graduate them and roll them over, we're, as of right now, able to accommodate all of our staffing needs um, at the elementary level. However, um, I wanted to 
have the discussion publicly with the board and also at the, with the community to say if, as a reminder, if we have any families who have not yet registered for kindergarten registration, um, please, the process continues throughout the spring. The sooner we know of our kindergartners, the better, um, so that as we continue into the spring as well as into early summer, we can certainly continue to monitor those elementary classes. Um, we also complete the transitioning of our students who are coming to us from early intervention services and we'll have special education supports in place um, so that again we continue can, can continue to be proactive and really be certain that we have the appropriate staffing in place at the elementary level. And then for the second part of my report tonight, I just have some congratulations, um, some to groups and some to individual students. In particular, we'd like to recognize Max Hafner, who received the 2018-19 Daughters of the American Revolution Good Citizen Award for, Amer uh, for Emmaus High School. And he was um, noted for being someone who's dependable, service-oriented, a great student leader, and patriotic. I'd also like to recognize the PA Music Educators, the PM. EA Association, um, those student musicians who participated in the annual band and orchestra for Lower Mukunji Middle School. We had Ian Bupre, Tristan Busleta, Alan Hahn, Brian Merck, Jonathan Poscadero, and Noah Taylor. I also want to recognize Brendan McCourt. You might recall Brendan was with us at our previous meeting. He's the state champ, um, the diving state champ, and he was also recognized as Morning Calls 2018-19 Boys Swimmer of the Year. And speaking of swimmers, our Emmaus Boys and Girls Swim Team also earned the honor of Morning Calls 2018-19 Boys and Girls Swim Teams of the Year. Um, last week, we had um, several students from our business department who participated in a really unique opportunity at Bloomsburg University. Bloomsburg, they um, sponsor a Husky Dog Pound competition, and this was their third annual event, and it's a spin on the show Shark Tank. So we had uh, three teams from Emmaus High School who participated, and they have three minutes and then a five minute Q&A to pitch their business idea to a panel of business professionals, corporate leaders, as well as business professors from Bloomsburg University. So um, I'd like to recognize some of our high school te student teams, Emily Lopez and Matt Rodriguez. Um, they pitched Seat Dash, which is an app that would allow food runners to deliver food to your seat at a sports stadium. <laughs> Gianna Bellastracci, um, she pitched her idea of Grazie Bella, which is an Italian bakery serving gluten-free and vegan treats. Connor Murray um, pitched the idea of kamikaze racing, and that's transforming regular cars into hot rods. And finally, Cole Hunter and Hunter Ruth, uh, Cole Scott, sorry, and Hunter Ruth pitched the idea of Bayside Pizza, which would be Ocean City, Maryland's first delivery on jet skis um, <laughs> to boats on the bay. And so some really amazing entrepreneurial and creative ideas on behalf of our teams. Um, maybe we could do like a board dash where you might bring food into the board. Um, and two, in particular, two of our teams, Emily Lopez, Matt Rodriguez, Rodriguez and Gina Bellastracci, um, Emily and Matt were together. So those two teams actually made it to the top 30. So that was a pretty amazing um, opportunity. And finally, um, I just want to again congratulate all of our secondary schools as they wrap, and our theater groups as they wrap up an outstanding spring theater season. Um, again, it began with Emmaus High School and Les Mis followed by Lower Mukunji Middle School and their performance of Into the Woods, and LMMS celebrated their 20-year anniversary for the LMMS Theater under the direction of Mr. Campbell. And then finally, we had Iyer Middle School, and they wrapped up our theater season with Aladdin Junior. So again, great job to all of our, of our secondary schools and their theater departments. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, uh, Mr. Ballard? Yes, um, Mrs. Campbell. Um, in your report to the board, you identified that the, a panel had been selected to study the early uh, or start of school time. And uh, I looked over the uh, panel selectees and I was concerned that it would appear just on the surface that there's no uh, devil's advocate or, uh, if you would, skeptic uh, indicated on that 
panel so that it looks like superficially that there's a large group of people who would be in favor of the change before you decide upon looking at the change. So I was concerned about uh, the makeup and making sure that that kind of consideration is, is there and also such considerations as daycare suppliers for example, if you, and, and linking it to the high school, if you have an older kid, you sometimes expect them to be home at a certain time so that they can watch the other kids when they come home from school. And if they're not gonna be getting home in time to match up with the elementary schedule, you have a situation where they might have to think about daycare and things like that. And the, also the timing is such that uh, it could affect timing schedules of daycares that we have, things like that so there wasn't anybody on the panel that was in the daycare industry or in, in any of those things that conceivably could be affected so I was concerned both that you didn't have somebody who was critical potentially on the panel and that, that, that some of the interests were not uh, necessarily uh, represented on the panel. So if you could take a look at that and see if there could be a couple of additions, I would appreciate your uh, looking at that and, and uh, deciding whether it would work that way. Sure, and I will, um, to give the, the, the community a sense of the um, composition, we have district administration, building administration, um, several parents, um, parents of high school students, middle school students, and or elementary students. And then um, we also have representation from, um, as well as a high school student. And I appreciate the, I appreciate how there might be a perception that um, the task force has a certain viewpoint. However, I will say that um, other than the initial outreach to invite the participants to um, be a part of the task force, I've had I've had no conversation with individual participants about what do you believe, and so I actually um, I'm hoping that we have varied perspectives on the board on, on our task force. Um, Particularly, I think a student representative is really important because that individual is then representing the views of, of his or her peers. And again, the goal of our task force really is to identify, as the board had outlined, what those obstacles or barriers are, as well as solutions. And so um, you bring up a great point in terms of being mindful that although maybe we have a certain role, district administrator, parent of East Penn kids, it's important that, I, that we all include other perspectives as well. Okay, well, I just noted that uh, some of the uh, participants looked like they had already spoken to the board about the necessity for doing this, and uh, it and they have certain expertise that would give their weight a little bit more uh, uh, solidified uh, position on the panel, and there was simply not. The additional type of person that you would say well, was coming in neutral or even against so that that position could be presented to the panel at the same time so that everybody has considered both sides of the entire argument. Okay. Uh, Dr. Levinson. Yes, uh, how soon after convening the task force might we get progress updates or, or, or information about what's been discussed? I think I can give the board a progress update along the way in terms of like, you know, report back at the May meeting, what we um, accomplished in between our our first meeting, which is next week, and then any successive meetings that might happen thereafter. Um, and ultimately, it's the group will be organic, and so what I mean by that is um, I think when we're at a point where we feel as if we've reviewed research and we've, we have a good sense of having identified all those obstacles and or barriers, as well as potential solutions to those barriers, then that would be the point at which we can sort of bring our final research or work to the board. I mean, I certainly don't anticipate this being a, a short conversation. I think there's going to be a lot of information <laughs> that has to be covered. 
and so I'm just being curious to, to get information along the way of what people are thinking about so that, you know, eventually I can make my own decision. Sure, we'll keep you updated. Mr. Champagne. Just to follow up on that, so the agenda would be not to necessarily recommend, or excuse me, would the agenda be to identify and evaluate all of the pros, the cons, the obstacles, the costs associated with not necessarily, at, and that information in its form, uh, in a form that is not recommending it or, or staying with the status quo, would that kind of information be given to us so we can have a, a look at the underlying kind of analysis before a recommendation is being made? Because I, I, I would feel it would be important for us to kind of see the, the background and all the data, in, in, even if it's in some kind of summary form, before we suddenly get presented with a recommendation to do this or not do this. I don't believe the, the um, guidance from the board was to provide a recommendation on doing this or not. It was exactly what you said. What are the obstacles to do this? Yeah, and and potential that. solutions. So I'm assuming we're going to get back what are the obstacles and potential solutions to changing the, the start date. Or what are some of the, and I assume with that, the associated impacts to... Uh, well, cost would be an obstacle. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> but impacts in terms of what it means to the other school districts or other activities mm -hmm. that we see in terms of LCTI, et cetera, et cetera. I, exactly, because what you've just identified, again, are, are the obstacles. And so, yes, I've been very clear with the task force. I literally took the language right from our board report in terms of what we were charged with. Um, my expectation was that we would then bring that information to the board, and I would assume there would be some discussion, debate about what's shared. Um, and then our task force may get some further direction in terms of um, based on where the board lands, like potentially to look at a plan for adjusting start times, or it, the board may come back with a completely different recommendation. I think at this point it's really, um, I think the research behind sort of some of the change is important, just so we have a, a consistent body of research to which we're referring. Um, but really it's about those obstacles and p potential solutions to changing start times at the secondary level. Any other comments, questions? Thank you for your report. Next is, is there anything else? No, okay. thank you. Um, next is a uh, motion for, uh, to adopt the proposed final budget. Um, may I have a uh, proposed final budget? Yes. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Um, and do you have any uh, additional information? Uh, this is basically so what we've comments. done last time. Yeah, I'll make a few like comments. As you uh, just mentioned, this is um, pretty much exactly what we reviewed uh, at the last meeting. Um, I'll just bring, uh, draw your attention to the key points that are inside the document, and I'll highlight a few of those briefly. Uh, the total budget is 158 million, uh, a little over 158 million. It has an 18.5497 uh, mil real estate tax rate, which is a 0.92% increase, as we've talked about. It does contain roughly a 5% budgetary reserve, and the ending fund balance um, would be 8.81% of total expenditures. Um, just a reminder, this is a, a works in progress budget. Um, as we've discussed, uh, there'll be an update again in May, and then we would bring a final um, um, budget recommendation in June, um, but this is being presented to comply with the statutory requirements of budget development and adoption. Questions, discussions? Dr. Levinson? In light of our discussion on, of communities and schools, where, where is that line item captured within, within the budget for, for what we're doing with the high school? <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, that, that is not in this. He said, I'm oh, sorry, for the high school. The high school. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. For the high school, where where is CIS captured in the budget for? Oh, the for high the school? high school? Yeah. Yeah, it's in the it's in the special education um, budget. Um, in terms of narrowing it to a specific line item here, I would have to go back and see where they have put it in the the line item. Okay. Thank you. 
Sure. Mr. Ballard? Um, because of the statutory requirements regarding fund un unencumbered fund balance of 8% or less to be able to raise taxes at all, could I have an explanation of why 8.81% on this summary is within those guidelines? Yeah, the, um, the statutory requirement has to do with budgeted fund balance. Um, so I'll dr I would draw your attention to the chart on page three. And you can see that the um, estimated ending fund, unassigned fund balance would be 4% because there'd be a fund balance assignment for the amount that the revenues, or sorry, the expenditures exceed the revenues. Okay, okay. so it's, it's the uh, assigned fund balance that gets us out of the, the problem. Correct. Okay. Yep, anything that is um, designated, um, committed, or assigned doesn't count toward that 8% limit. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> Ms. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Flanders? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to personnel, may I have a motion for all the personnel items? So, second. <coughs> Any discussion? Ms. Allen, will you call the roll? Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Flanders? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Uh, motion passes. Uh, moving on to the, uh, may I have a motion uh, for the bill list, approval of the bill list? So moved. Second. So, okay. Any discussion? Quick question. Um, Ms. Bellman? Yes. <laughs> On the bill list, there were a couple right in the beginning, uh, Hampton Inn and Sellings Grove that was 2000 and well, another one is almost 2000. Is that, I, I was trying to figure out like what, Swim how team. many, what? Swim team at States. <laughs> oh, thank you. It just seemed like a big, it seemed like a very big hotel bill. Okay. Been there done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank oh, you. Another board member answered my question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Comments? Ms. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Flanders? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to uh, the food service contract. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Champagne? Yeah, I had raised a question about the, the, the pro forecasted loss. Somebody explain to me, what, is that actually what's going to happen, or is it just the way the contract documents have to be prepared? Or Yeah, I can address that. And, and actually, it's what we hope will happen. Um, okay. So I will, <laughs> yeah, so I'll refresh your memory. Um, when we had our year-end audit for the year ending June 30, 2018, we had a finding um, that said, according to federal regulations, schools shall limit its net cash resources to an amount that does not exceed three months average expenditures. And it continues that in, a, in an attempt to conserve uh, resources, the food service entity contracts with third party, et cetera, et cetera, but we've seen increased profitability. So we're actually exceeding, again, the statutory limit for um, funds in the food service fund no, so okay. our um our um, response to that was that we would um, upgrade cafeteria equipment and we would shift some expense for um, custodial costs that are related to um, the lunchtime activities uh, to the um, food service fund so we're so drawing down that fund balance that's exactly what we're doing yes Mr. Ballard. Yeah, I would also uh, point out that the food service in the East Penn is supposed to be self-supporting. So we don't contribute budgetary funds necessarily to the food service like a lot of districts do. And Nutrition Inc. has done such a good job on revamping our food service, modernizing it, and getting efficiencies of scale that we have become too efficient for our own good. 
and uh, we've got to reinvest some of that efficiency back into the equipment or otherwise we're violating a federal guideline is what it amounts to. So uh, I have to commend the business office and the food service people for doing an outstanding job on keeping this basically out of our budget. And while I can make a comment on that, and while I appreciate the um, recognition of the business office, it really is our food service provider, uh, um, nutrition, who's who's doing a fabulous job um, with that. Um, thank you, Dr. Levinson. So I'll agree that Nutrition Inc. is doing a very good job, but I have a general question: was this, uh, <laughs> this particular contract was this bid out or? Were there any other players? Yes. In fact, um, it was bid out last year. So it is bid for a five-year period, but the um, Department of Food and Nutrition at the state level requires that a new um, exhibit be approved by the board each year. So the, you will see this each okay. year. Um, but we did uh, put it out for RFP last year. We had two proposals that were received. Um, they were evaluated and adjudicated, and um, the decision was made to continue with nutrition. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Bowman? I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time for my question or not, but given that there's a surplus of funds that might potentially alleviate this, I'll mention it. Um, the only um, complaint that's ever come to me by multiple people about our food service is the lack of vegetarian items. And I'm wondering if, um, given that we have, we're making too much money off of our food, maybe there's a way to use that to pay for more variety so that vegetarian students actually have something substantial that they can eat at lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? <laughs> Questions? Ms. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Flanders? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Uh, is there any um, objection to uh, taking item C through F uh, together? Mr. Ballard? I would like item F pulled out okay. separately. So C through E together? We have a motion. Actually, one of them, E, is a just to report. Uh, Both information. For, just, for information. So C and D together. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Ballard? Um, on the uh, bid opening reports, which are now announcements part of this motion, I guess, um, could I have an a readout from our solicitor as to whether or not there's any provision for um, de minimis differences between the bids such that each uh, bidder within a thousand two bidders being within a thousand dollars of each other or something like that there's a reason to be able to choose either one uh, the law requires you to award the bid to the lowest responsible bidder. Period. Doesn't differentiate between the thousand or two thousand. Period. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion or questions? Ms. Allen, will you call the roll? Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Flanders? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to the Board of Contract in item F. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Ballard? Uh, the reason for my question to uh, the solicitor was that if you look carefully at the way the bids came out, the two general contractors basically came out to be um, very close. extremely close, and the district now has no option to choose between them based on perhaps past experience with any of them and I don't most of you were not here for the built right controversy I know the solicitor was and uh, that came about from a situation we're stuck with low bid so understand that if we come up with any problems later on down the uh, down the road uh, 
we didn't have any chance to shade anything back and forth for the for a sum of less than five hundred dollars so i'll just show that okay thank you any other questions or discussion Ms. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Flanders? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Um, may I have a motion for uh, items A and B in curriculum? So moved. So moved. Second. Um, any discussion? Ms. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Flanders? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motions pass. Uh, moving on to uh, policies, uh, our second reading. Are there any comments? <clears throat> Mr. Povolitis, I think you have a couple, you have, we have a few changes that we made that we just wanted to highlight. Okay, good evening. Uh, policy 222 on page two of two under guidelines. Language was changed to include both immediately and as soon as practicable in a more appropriate way. <laughs> Moving on to policy 323, <laughs> page two of two under guidelines. There's a strike through in the language requiring a physician's written order. In policy 7. 07, page 505, under the use of district grounds, there's strike through language in our current board policy, and we added new language based on board feedback at the last meeting. And policy 904, page two of two, at the top of that page, we added nicotine and nicotine delivery products based on board feedback. Thank you. Are there any board members that have specific uh, Mr. Ballard. Okay, I'm just making sure I got the right policy number here. Uh, 707. I appreciated the uh, restructuring of the uh, part about the animals. The only question I had for the solicitor was the language that was put in there for the individuals with disabilities. It, does it uh, preclude um, so-called emotional support animals, which are not? Um, you know, it's the, it's the controversy that all the airlines have had with people buying fake vests on eBay and calling it an emotional support animal and saying that uh, it has to be out there uh, as uh, that is, is there something to review there or um, this is in pa uh, five on uh, page uh, five of five. Yeah, I know exactly what you're referring to. That, uh, that link the additional language and the strike through, first of all, came as a result of the discussion at the board. Yes. But secondly, the actual language that was added, that was actually added by myself in consultation with Mr. Povolitis, and it's actually similar to language that's in existing policies dealing with service. I'm comfortable okay. with the addition. So it links the individual with disability, and that my only question is, does it exclude emotional support animals too? No, it's, it's all covered. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Levinson? Yeah, so I don't recall there being a conclusive answer to this question when I asked it last time. Um, but uh, how, how do we address student use of smoking cessation products? So um, that's a great question. So that's would be under policy 222, um, which is the pupils. And we will have administrative regulations once this policy is done um, that the administration will look at and uh, bring in feedback from administration to uh, further investigate that and clarify that. OK, so it'll be that's in queue? Yes. Um, Mr. Flanders. This may be a, a silly thing, but um, with the additional language that was added, it's the sentence starts out, notwithstanding the foregoing. Uh, how about just however? <laughs> you can but, tell a lawyer put that. <laughs> <laughs> and the other, the other part that's related, um, living catty corner to Lincoln, is there some way that we actually can enforce this? Because I see both people with dogs there constantly. It's one of the few large pieces of green in Emmaus that's not a public park and people do like to run their dogs there and I, I didn't know if more signs or anything else I, I don't know what can be done about that where is that at Lincoln oh that is true 
should look into that. Any other questions or comments? Okay, that concludes the second reading. Uh, we'll have the, uh, the policies uh, on the agenda at the next meeting for uh, final approval. Okay. Uh, moving on to uh, LCTI, uh, do we have a, a, a report? Yes, uh, the last meeting of the Joint Operating Committee was held on March 27th. Um, some key highlights, uh, as mentioned earlier by Ms. Campbell, uh, and also in the last meeting, of the, the reception of the, the welding lab groundbreaking had was just phenomenal. Uh, they reported that you know they've gotten great accolades from the state and local and and, and uh, federal officials. So it's it was a great event. Um, uh, second point, Dr. Rushton, who's the executive director up at LCTI, he's been asked to participate uh, with other business and community leaders in the what is referred to is the Allentown Vision 2030, which is, I guess, a forward-looking uh, project to kind of see what Allentown would look like in, in terms of business, education, et cetera. Um, the uh, LCTI 2019-20 budget was overwhelmingly approved by all of the participating districts. Uh, there were 65 yes votes and no votes no and six absent votes so a very you know good effort by all and then finally i'll make a plug again for camp lcti uh, they're pushing obviously to get as many kids who are interested in career uh, and technical education opportunities this camp lcti is for fifth and eighth graders there's two sessions one on june 17th through 21st and the other is june 24th through the 28th uh, again the catch is if you register by May 1st, you get a free T-shirt. So get those <laughs> kids going. <laughs> Thank you. That's my report. Are there any questions or comments from Mr. Champagne? Thank you. Um, moving on uh, to legislative, uh, Mr. Ballard. Okay, from the legislative standpoint, there is uh, not too much going on right now. They're still in budget hearings trying to figure out what they're going to propose. From the legislature in response to the uh, governor's budget, uh, as soon as I hear anything, I'll let you know. Uh, since our last meeting, I've attended two different uh, meetings. One was the National School Boards Association conference in Philadelphia. Um, I'll try to make a quick report on that tonight, and uh, next time I'll talk to you about the uh, school law workshop that was held by PSBA uh, about four days later uh, that I went to and had some interesting stuff. But I attended the national convention. I got this fan. Uh, they didn't have t-shirts. So uh, I have something for everybody on the board. Uh, pass these along and take one. It's a window sticker that says PA Public Schools Success Starts Here. It's a, a good message to get out to our public. And then I have uh, another goodie from PSBA. Each take one and enjoy yourselves as much as possible <laughs> with this uh, thing. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a challenge to get all the board members to uh, pass it along uh, correctly. And Ms. Allen, I'll have one for you tomorrow uh, when I deliver some other stuff. <laughs> um, I have some general notes that I thought had some interesting things that the uh, school board would be interested in. I'll be sending you some articles from the... Uh, from the uh, meeting. Uh, there were a lot of good sessions. There was a lot of advertising sessions too, so it was a mixed bag. Um, one of the things that I came away with was some, I went on the school security and safety track, and most of the sessions were involved with that. One of the general things that uh, was mentioned there, and I thought it was a very good idea to, to spread amongst the school district, is that we need to train our students about how permanent everything on the internet is. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about people going back and finding comments that you made uh, on a blog from your high school that you thought you deleted and the Wayback Machine had <laughs> preserved those. Mm -hmm. In case you don't know what that is, it's a uh, archive, <laughs> internet archive, that has been grabbing web pages on a regular basis since basically the start of the internet and they have terabytes of old web pages and if you ever want to see an old web page in many cases you can go back on this and see what was on there on a certain date uh, from the Wayback Machine and uh, 
there's a lot of stuff out there that people thought had disappeared and it hasn't. So we need to caution our students uh, about how permanent all of that stuff is. Uh, there was an Illinois district that had um, an outstanding school emergency plan that I thought I would pass on the information to our uh, administration about. It, it went down into details such as including emergency backpacks in every room and small office, including reflecting vests for the teachers, emergency supplies, and response items such as large red and green cards to hold up with accountability responses. That meant that you could look over a field where you gathered people up and you could see their green and red cards at a glance. Green meant everybody was accounted for, and red, they would write on there who was not accounted for, so you could go quickly through, gather up the red cards, and then try to uh, assess what you could do uh, with those uh, missing students. Um, they also had every building entrance numbered and color coded so they could tell first responders and everybody else um, how they could you know what building entrance you know where the danger was at or where they were supposed to use to get out of a building and etc and each different building had different levels with different color codes to uh, you know, match up with that so if you're told to go to the green exit to get out of the building from the third floor everybody went down to the green exit and went out uh, things like that in their emergency plan um, they had identified three off-site locations for each building for evacuation. So if the first one wasn't any good, they could go to the second, and if that wasn't any good, they could go to the third. So they they have a plan to evacuate to three different spots for each building so that they don't have to be, you know, they don't have to run into a uh, fire situation on this side or a flooding situation on this side or anything um, else like that. Um, and also visitors to the Illinois School District have to leave their driver's license at the office when they go in and they wear a red lanyard so they can be spotted with, uh, with ease inside the building. So it gets people to check out also and that's just not go out through a door because they don't have their driver's license with them. And uh, landscaping around the buildings no higher than two feet so nobody can hide behind it. Things like that. They had really done a, uh, a great job. There were a number of sessions that talked about zero tolerance not working and um, that was a, a sort of a public gist I can give you of the uh, thing and like I said I'll send you some articles that you'll find very interesting I think about the problems of communicating in a crisis and um, steps you have to take to ensure that you can account for all students before parents try to pull them away from your accountability area. And believe me, that is a problem that they've had to deal with in some of the situations. And we heard some very uh, blood-curdling tales, if you will, about situations that we've not heard about in the news that were stopped uh, because of um, good community involvement and reporting to the proper authorities of situations that had gotten out of hand. and. Um, We've been very lucky in some cases. So they were talking about all the things you have to plan for, and it was a very interesting set of sessions. They had a number of SROs there, and also chiefs of police and other uh, uh, law enforcement officials, including from the federal level, that attended these sessions and, and uh, added to the comments. And I thought it was uh, very, very useful. So thank you very much for sending me, and I wish more of you would go, because I think you'd all benefit from some of the mingling with school districts all across the country who have some of the same problems we have and some of the problems we don't have and which for which we're fortunate and uh, I think that moves on well we'll go on to 11 I guess the uh, later on but uh, that's the uh, legislative report for this time thank you uh, mr. champagne yeah, I just want to add one thing and, and mr. Bell was at the advocacy conference that uh, P, uh, uh, NSP had the whole push of that conference was to get reauthorization for IDEA and I read recently that that has been sponsored both in the House and in the Senate and I would encourage anyone who has a role to play in the community or just every parent to look at how that additional funding for IDEA could 
support a lot of the programs we talked about today. You know, we currently get about 15% for special education. The promise made back in the Ford administration was 40%. So, you know, I think, you know, that is another thing that I'd love to see this district do is to really look to advocate for support of IDEA in, in the, the House and the Senate. And we've got, you know, Susan Wild, who is on the Education Committee, who is a very strong supporter of public education uh, as an advocate for, for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith. Just really quick um, to uh, follow up on the comment about the red and the green card. I don't know if we use that system here or not. Um, there are uh, hard plastic clam shell half inch thick containers that will have a clipboard on one side and you can stuff all the important documents in them and they're red on one side, green on the other for that same exact purpose. So I don't know, something to think about. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? Thank you for your report, Mr. Ballard. Uh, moving on to uh, item 10A, resignation. Um, I have a motion. So moved. Second. Um, is there any discussion? Mr. I'd, I'd just like to say that I am very grateful for the chance to be on the board, uh, having been appointed, and I'd like to thank the rest of the board members and the administration for all their help and support during that time. It has been a pleasure, and I hope to do it again someday somewhere else. Thank you. We uh, really appreciate your service on the board. I just wanted to say, um, as I was as I was reflecting on tonight, or thinking about tonight, I was reflecting on for the number of years that Seth and I had worked together, and it's actually um, came to know each other quite well back in 2004 when we served on um, a subcommittee of the East Penn Comprehensive Plan, and we were really looking at our district comprehensive assessment system at the time, um, and and since then. Seth and I, our paths have crossed um, professionally on a number of projects, and I've always been committed to his, I've always been impressed with his commitment to public education and improving the quality of what, we, what we're doing here in East Penn. Um, I also have always appreciated Seth's desire to really understand a topic from all sides. It could be the engineer in him. Um, <laughs> But to truly understand from all sides um, and all viewpoints before he then um, makes a decision of his own and, and decides whether or not to, to move forward with something. So I've sincerely appreciated working alongside him on many projects. Um, I've enjoyed our conversations about teaching and learning that we had quite recently um, and certainly wish him the best in his new professional and personal adventures. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. <clears throat> Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Flanders? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes, and I have uh, two announcements to make. Um, as a token of appreciation and in honor of your dedicated service as a board member to the uh, East Penn School District, a com commemorative stoneware plaque is being made especially for you by the Emmaus High School Mud Club, uh, and the plaque will be shipped to you following its completion. Thank you. Um, and then for the rest of the board, um, uh, Mr. Flanders' resignation will leave an opening on the uh, LCTI Joint Operating Commission uh, Committee that we will have to fill uh, once we fill his uh, seat on, on this board. So just to uh, have that in the back of your, um, your mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to a discussion item um, for uh, filling the seat um, with uh, Mr. Flanders' resignation effective uh, April 15th. We have, um, we can fill his uh, position anytime until, I guess, just after the next meeting, um, and it won't go to the courts. And my understanding from hearing in the past, we can choose whatever procedure we want as long as it's done in public. Is correct. That correct. So I wanted to have a discussion. I've heard a couple of comments. Yeah. Um, 
I, I can just throw some out that I've heard other board members. Um, we well, what we've done in the past, we've had uh, people apply and had an interview. Um, most recently, we've had people that have recently applied um, and chosen between them. Um, I've heard people um, mention there is an election going on, so there are uh, candidates vying for uh, school board positions, uh, and in particular, two of them, uh, three of them at least, have um, previously expressed interest in our um, um, uh, processes before. Um, and so I just throw it out if people have ideas for how they want to uh, uh, fill this position. Um, I guess the default will be to solicit uh, interest and in resumes, but uh, there might be something we can do. Dr. Munson? Uh, yeah, well, I actually have a question. So what is the tenure of this position that we need to fill? December through December. Okay, so it, it is. It's, it's a very short-term position. Okay, yeah. I mean, in in light of that, I, I would, I would advocate doing something that is as simple as possible. Yes. Um, and I think people who have expressed an interest in before, either through um, standing for election or coming previously before the board, as well as people who have prior board service, um, you know, might be good candidates for this particular situation. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Ballard? Okay. It, in the past, there have been questions about whether one should give a leg up to anybody who's running for office by appointing them to the board. Uh, because it's both a short term and uh, there is an election going on, my suggestion would be that we consider people who are not running but did apply previously, uh, if there are any of those, I don't know what the, the numbers are, or a former board, there was at least one former board member who had applied previously, uh, and pick one of those for the short term so that we don't appear to be giving a, uh, advantage of publicity, free publicity, or whatever it is, to somebody who's currently running for office. Mr. Smith? Um, while I appreciate that comment, um, I, I do remember the last time we had this conversation, and we had quite a difficult time making a decision between two very qualified candidates. And, um, you know, thinking back to two times ago when we um, opened up the search to the same pool of applicants and I would be, if we were to do that same thing again um, and we take a look at the results from the last time, um, there's one candidate who um, just based on that merit alone seems to be a logical um, <coughs> appointee based on our conversations that we had the last time and on that merit alone I don't think while this person is um, currently running for uh, one of the seats and in, in the in the primary I think on those merits alone just the fact that we've discussed um, these candidates before and and had such a hard time making a decision um, it would not be in my mind, seen as playing favorites. So um, I, I'm suggesting that in the, in, the, in the simplest, easiest way of, of doing this, um, that we um, would be looking, looking to uh, appoint uh, Mr. Jankowski um, because he was the runner-up from the last time. Thank you. Ms. Bowman, did you have a hand up? Oh, no. Okay. Any other comments? Um, I would make a comment. I would generally would have agreed with Mr. Ballard, but um, the last, I think, two people we've appointed had not won in the next <laughs> election, so that's one thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one argument That's against that. That's a kind that. of favoritism, too. <laughs> yes. So it might be uh, bad luck for us to appoint someone. Um, and there is um, one person running opposed, if that was a concern, uh, running unopposed for the two-year term. So that would be an option that wouldn't be perhaps give them a, a leg up. So uh, is there any other discussion on it? I guess um, I'm in agreement with uh, Dr. Munson that we do something simple because it is a relatively short term. Um, no takers on. Uh, I agree with that. Simple. Simple. No um, one's going to speak up for complexity? Yes. 
we could do have a five step process maybe <laughs> um, does anyone opposed uh, choosing between uh, so the 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 runner-up on the last time was uh, Mr. Jeff Shinkowski, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Naomi, um, why is her last name escape me? Winch. Winch, Winch um, <laughs> I think, is running unopposed for the two-year term. Um, I would propose choosing between one of those two candidates. Can we appoint someone without their consent? <laughs> I mean, do we know if Mr. Jankowski is interested in filling the position? We can ask him, can't we? Or somebody we starting early. Somebody's in the room. What? Or somebody starting early. They might have a commitment that they can't be. Yeah. We need to ask, I guess. Okay. Um, maybe I propose that we uh, try to con do, can, can we contact both of them if they're interested in serving early? <laughs> what? Oh, right they're, they're both here. Okay. <laughs> Are you both interested in... Uh, in starting early, if you could. <laughs> yes. Well, you can't get this one vacancy yet. Yeah. yeah. So the at the next meeting. Do it at the next meeting. At the next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be advertised. Simply. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the board's call if you want to have another interview with either one of them. You just want to make a decision at the next meeting. If you don't do an official interview, we don't have to advertise. Well, that's what I'm saying. Board. Yeah, we I just, would propose that. just bring that. them in and we right do the, the voting agenda. process. Put it on the agenda. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. That's simple. That's simple. <laughs> okay. There'll be agenda on the next meeting. Uh, on the next, for the next meeting. Agenda item. All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on uh, to re resolution, or uh, I guess it's a resolution to adopt uh, both of the uh, proposed resolutions. Uh, Mr. Ballard, do you want to um, propose? Well, the question is, does anybody want to split them or do they want to talk about them both? And then I have some suggested changes by Mr. Champagne that I have no problem with and I could just give to the board secretary. It, it's, there are editorial changes. They don't change anything that m makes any difference. Uh, I didn't hear anything beforehand to split them, so I'd assume we take a motion to take them both up. And if there's any, then I move that we take up both motions. Second. Any discussion, Mr. Ballard? Do you want to start? Basically, these are from PSPA. They address two different aspects of the cyber charter uh, problem. Uh, one of which is the. Uh, differential between cyber charter costs and the amount we're forced to pay for uh, individual students of ordinary students and special education students and that's just a general statement of principle and the other one is of support of two senate bills or excuse me a senate bill and a house bill that basically would say that if the district offers its own cyber charter uh, school that parents who want to send their kids to another cyber charter school pay the tuition for that cyber charter school and uh, both of those to PSBA and to myself seem to be fair uh, our cyber charter school the last time I heard was under four thousand dollars per student mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that still mm -hmm. yes true and that's far less than the uh, Less than half. Less, yeah, less than half, or, or even sometimes a quarter of what some students just, or what some schools have to pay for cyber charter schools. And I urge you to support this uh, information, which will go to our legislators and to PSBA to let them know we're supporting their legislative efforts. Any other discussion or questions? Uh, one other question. Does anybody have, have any questions uh, about having some minor things that we would replace uh, by the district with EPSD and put cyber in front of every charter school thing in the uh, resolution supporting statewide cyber charter school funding reform? And a you couple of to? things about the Commonwealth, but that's just saying instead of Pennsylvania saying the Commonwealth, yeah. they're all in the changes. Uh, offer that as a friendly amendment. Yes, I do. To make those changes. <laughs> and who were the two? You were the sponsor uh, of the motion. Sponsor, and who was second? second? Okay, so okay. motion I'll on the floor this. is the. Uh, <laughs> I'll give it to the board mandate. secretary after we're done. Okay. There's no more discussion. Uh, Ms. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Flanders? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Thank you. 
Uh, announcements. There was a um, executive session before the meeting today uh, where we discussed personnel. Uh, the next uh, regular board meeting will be on Monday, May 13th at 7.30 here. I'll now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, board is adjourned. Meeting is adjourned. Beer? <coughs> I think it's a beer code.